And now let's discover Simon Taylor Coleridge. Coleridge was born in Devonshire in 1772. He studied at Christ Hospital School in London and then in Cambridge, but uh, unfortunately he never graduated. He was uh, a very absent-minded student. He was strongly influenced by the French revolutionary ideals, but uh, after the disillusionment with the French Revolution, he planned a utopian commune-like society, Pantisocracy, along with uh, his friend uh, Robert Southey in Pennsylvania. But this project came to an end. What was it? Well, he strongly believed that uh, uh, mankind is uh, good and uh, that men and women uh, could share everything. So he um, projected a sort of uh, society with uh, 12 couples uh, and everything in common, a house, uh, money, also marriages, also love. But uh, yes, it uh, didn't work. Fruitful artistic collaboration with the poet and friend William Wordsworth in the 1797 and 1799 period when they uh, together planned the lyrical ballads. He died in 1834. Unfortunately, he suffered all his life from rheumatism and so he was compelled to take a lot of medicine. The medicine at the time, which could uh, um, release pain, was just uh, opium and so he was a sort of uh, opium addicted. You know that uh, opium is a very um, strong drug. His main works are The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner and pay attention to the word. It is the ancient mariner and not just a very simple old sailor. Why? Because, of course, it's a metaphor for ancient mariner. A mariner who is a sort of abstract figure doomed to tell his story along all his life, uh, eternal life, uh, so he's a sort of uh, uh, spirit uh, and which uh, can spell, can make spell and compel the people to hear, to listen to his story. And he warns uh, mankind uh, to respect uh, nature. This is the main message of uh, uh, the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Then he wrote Christabel, an unfinished narrative poem, and a dreamlike poem, Kubla Khan, which was uh, composed under the influence of opium and actually it is not uh, finished. Well, the poet himself says that uh, he was uh, um, suddenly stopped by uh, the doorbell and so he could not finish it as uh, he really wanted to. In 1817 he wrote Biographia Literaria, a classic text of literary criticism and autobiogra autobiography where he explained um, the um, project of uh, the lyrical ballads uh, along with uh, William Wordsworth, uh, his friend. And actually, uh, they, their close um, friendship uh, uh, brought them to the Lake District to plan a sort of uh, manifesto to react against uh, the uh, artificiality of uh, the Augustan poetry. So, words or poetry, uh, the main features of words or poetry are the following. So, the content are mainly things from ordinary life. The aim of uh, his poetry was to give uh, this ordinary life, uh, or ordinary things, uh, sorry, the charm of novelty. So, he believed uh, that uh, men are so busy 
in uh, their stressful everyday life uh, that they can't uh, see uh, ordinary things, uh, they can't enjoy the um, authenticity and uh, the um, the, the precious side of ordinary things. And so he wanted to give those ordinary things the charm of novelty. The style, the language used by Wordsworth, was the language of common man, purified by the poet. And his main interest was the relationship between man and nature and the imagination as a means of knowledge while Coleridge was interested in supernatural characters. The supernatural characters were a sort of metaphors, a sort of symbols carrying important messages. The aim was to give them a semblance of truth through this willing suspension of disbelief so what does this mean? This means very simply that when you read a novel you like, let's imagine a very simple Harry Potter who everybody likes, everybody knows, you suspend your disbelief when you read a novel and you, you think, you believe that everything you are reading is true because you like to believe it as true and to live different lives, the lives of the protagonists, the lives of the characters in that particular novel. The style of Coleridge is a bit different from Wordsworth's style, so it is a bit more difficult because he used the archaic language, rich in sound devices, and of course to give those words a specific meaning. His main interest is the creative power of imagination. And um, yes, he divided imagination in um, three different uh, um, concepts. So the primary imagination is the experience uh, uh, um, every human being uh, uh, live. It is linked to perception, it is an unconscious process, uh, and it manifests itself uh, through images which recall relevant past sensorial experiences. The secondary imagination is something superior because it can be experienced only by the poet. He dissolves the images linked to past experiences in order to recreate, so to recreate symbols, metaphors, poems. So the result of this process is the new word of the poem. The fancy, well, the fancy is just a mode of memory. It is not creative, it is inferior to imagination, and it is the poet's logical faculty to create devices like metaphors and similes in order to blend various ingredients. Nature is uh, a bit different from uh, Wordsworth's conception because Coleridge uh, did not view nature as a moral guide or a source of consolation. Nature for Coleridge uh, uh, represented um, more the divine, so it represented the awareness of the presence of the ideal in the real, a sort of platonic vision. It was not identified with the divine, but in part it was. So it was, uh, uh, for example, in the rhyme of uh, um, the ancient mariner, um, nature is uh, um, nature carries uh, creatures uh, which are created by God. And uh, when the mariner kills uh, the albatross, uh, he kills a creature of God. So he deserves uh, punishment, uh, he deserves uh, sufferances, uh, and only after uh, many, well, only after much sufferances uh, can he 
repent and can he understand that nature carries God, the message of God. So nature had an essential role in poetic creativity because it stimulated the poet to find natural symbols that could reflect his emotion and feelings. The shape and colors of nature represented and symbolized emotional and mental states. This is, of course, more easy, more, yes, easier to be understood when you read the rhyme of the ancient mariner. And now the rhyme of the ancient mariner, just some hints on the plot. It is the story of a mariner who commits an act against nature by killing an albatross, and so against God. At the beginning of the poem, the mariner stops a wedding guest. The, get, the wedding guest is spelled, is stopped by the glittering eye of the mariner, and so the guest cannot choose but hear a sad, mysterious story about the burden of the mariner's guilt. The mariner expiates his sin at the end by traveling around and telling the people he meets his story, so he wants to teach them love and respect for nature's creatures. The characters uh, in the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner are, of course, the mariner, who is an unnaturally old, with skinny hands and glittering eyes, a sort of magic creature. The sailors, uh, who are ill-fated members uh, of the ship carrying the mariner. The wedding guest, uh, who is one of the three people on their way to a wedding reception, and after hearing the Ancient Mariner's story, he becomes both sadder but wiser. Death, embodied in a hulking form of the ghost ship, he plays dice with life and death and wins the lives of the sailors. So the sailors die, but they are there on the ship, remembering the, mar the mariner uh, about his uh, uh, awful act. And life in death, embodied by a beautiful ghostly woman, she wins the ancient mariner's soul, playing dice, and condemns him to a limbo-like living death. And the atmosphere is mysterious and dreamlike. The rhyme follows the structure of uh, medieval ballads. So it is uh, mostly written in four line stanzas. It's a mix. It's a mixer of dialogue and narration. It is a dramatic story. The language is archaic and realistic in details and imagery. There are frequent repetition. There are refrains, um, alliteration, internal rhyme. The theme is a travel wandering, the supernatural, and while in the medieval ballads there was no aim, in the rhyme of the ancient mariner there is a name, so it's a didactic message, you must respect nature. There are many interpretations um, for the rhyme, it is just a description of a dream because poor Samuel Taylor Coleridge was opium addicted. It can be read as an allegory of the life of the soul, from crime to punishment to redemption, and this is the most uh, um, accepted interpretation. It's a metaphor of man's original sin in Eden. It is the poetic journey of Romanticism, so the mariner represents the poet and his guilt is the origin of poetry. And a regret for a state of lost innocence caused by the Industrial Revolution. But um, the most accepted, the most spread interpretation is the allegory of the life of the soul and uh, 